Welcome back to Feed the Post. I'm your host, Joe Jackson. Today, we're going to figure out if Big Ten basketball just bad. Week one of college basketball is officially done with the IU Army game just finishing up a couple hours ago as of recording, and it wasn't a great week for Big Ten in general. Um, a lot of teams, well, we'll get into all of them, just didn't live up to what some of the preseason hype was. There's a couple teams that really showed out. Um, and we're just going to kind of go team by team and talk through each of them and then preview the next week, um, in which we'll get some good games. We have the Gavit games. Uh, Michigan State takes on Duke also. Like, going to be some good games. So we can just jump right into it. We'll go through alphabetically. Uh, start with Illinois. They go 2-0 and on the week, beat Eastern Illinois 80-52 to and Oakland 64-53. to um, this is, you know, two, this is a lot of, a lot of teams were like this with two by games, um, Illinois, both games were very slow in the first half. And I think that's the main concern is just like, can't, you know, will they put it together for 40 minutes, but also against these teams, they have no need to, uh, Eastern Illinois, it was pretty close for the first 20. They went by 28 Oakland. It was close for the first 20 or so, um, maybe even a little bit more than that. And they end up winning by 11. I would say. I didn't watch too much of the Oakland game. I did watch all of the Eastern Illinois game. Dre Gibbs or uh, Dre Gibbs Lawhorn off the bench for Illinois gave them a huge spark in that first game against Eastern Illinois. They were kind of Illinois just seemed pretty lethargic overall. Um, I thought they weren't moving the best or things like that. And then Dre Gibbs Lawhorn comes off the bench, gives them 18 points, uh, five of five from two, two of five from three. Thought that was really good. I do love like this Illinois defense in general. Um, and I think that's going to be their calling card, especially with these Ty Rogers at the point. Like that lineup's massive. It's Ty, you know, it's six six plus everywhere um, with Rogers, Shannon, Domask, uh, Garrier, and you know Coleman Hawkins, and obviously rotating through that. I am a little surprised that Garrier's um, been getting the starts. He, you know, he played pretty well against Oakland. Thirteen points, ten rebounds, got a double double there. I wasn't honestly, tr like truthfully, I wasn't expecting him to contribute too much to Illinois this year. If he does, that's a huge boost for them, just giving them more of a bigger body to play alongside Coleman Hawkins because right now Hawkins is playing only at the five. Um, him and Danja are splitting at the five. Amani Hansberry, the freshman, is getting a few minutes. He's also playing solely the five for right now. Um, that's, you know, when you look go back to last year, Hawkins and Danja shared the floor a lot. It got a little clunky, specifically defensively, as Hawkins was like forced to be a perimeter defender. For anybody that watched my previous stuff, like you know, I think Hawkins is a top five defender in the Big Ten. But now, as since he's at the five, he's only playing really drop coverage. If they need him to, he can switch, he can hedge. Um, but he's he's kind of acting as their rim protector, and he's just he's going to be the one that has to he's going to be the one that has to take this team to where they need to go. Obviously, Shannon is the the guy on the team um, in, in terms of like go to scoring and playmaking. Shannon's going to get the ball in his hands, but Hawkins is the guy that can facilitate. He can sort of shoot. He needs to be able to rebound well, defend the rim well. Um, you know, we're looking against Oakland, eight points, eight rebounds, and five assists. Like you're hoping for maybe a little bit more scoring production from him. Uh, but the assist is huge, especially with the lineup that Ty Rogers is the point guard. I think I think it'll work because everybody else can pass as well, especially in that starting lineup. Really, the only like negative passer or non-passer would be Gary, in my opinion. Um, Shannon Hawkins, Domas. I mean, Domas is running the backup point for Illinois now. Uh, they're just they're running big there. Um, they have they they probably need Harmon to cut to get into things a bit more. Um, I think he could be a more of a defender off of the bench, especially if he's paired with Dre um, or just whoever else. So I don't, you know, Illinois is a team that there isn't, I don't think too much to talk on right now. Uh, we'll know more next week, but you look through their schedule, they play Marquette next week. Um, and then after that, they have three more pretty easy buy games. Uh, and then they, and then it's a couple big 10 games sandwiched uh, with Florida Atlantic sandwiched between them. So you kind of, we'll be able to find out more in a few weeks, what Illinois is actually about. Um, but for right now, not a ton. We'll move on to uh, Indiana, who is going to be one of the bigger talking points for this week. They go 2-0 um, on the week. They beat Florida Gulf Coast 69-63, and then they beat Army 72-64. The Florida Gulf Coast, like that's a very good mid-major team. That's a team that could very easily win their league or be top two, three in their league. Um, first game. A lot of new pieces. I don't think that one was as worrisome to me. 
um, this army one is getting to the point where it's like, okay, yeah, this is this is a little bit worrisome. Um, just both games, like we the concerns of how does this team fit or like this team can't fit because it's a bunch of bigs, they really came through. Um, the Florida Gulf Coast game, especially Florida Gulf Coast goes 13 to 34 from three. McBacco in both games got benched in the second half um, for usually Gabe Cups was the one that came in. We'll talk about him in a second. But even then, that Florida Gulf Coast, the way that Indiana is running their defense is where is the rim protector? And he should be. He's an elite rim protector. Like, I think he's going to be one of the better defenders in the Big Ten. But that means Renew's on the perimeter. And Renew is just not fully ready for that, I think, yet. Um, he was the one, He was oftentimes one – that was just getting scrambled and allowing open threes, but it wasn't just him. And especially in the army game too, you saw it pretty consistently everywhere. Like I use just not in sync on what they want to do defensively. Um, where is generally, I think not switching. And I think they're switching more or less one through four elsewhere, but it wasn't, didn't seem like it was an automatic. It, it felt like there wasn't as much communication. There wasn't as much engagement. Um, jo like Xavier Johnson has to be in a really good perimeter defender. Trey Galloway has to be a really good perimeter defender. If that happens, you have a good interior defender with Kalel Ware um, who can protect the rim. Then things can go. Anthony Walker off the bench, I thought both games got lost a ton defensively. Um, Payne Sparks didn't play the first game. He played against Army. I think he's trying to find his way. And then like when CJ Gunn, I, I like defensively, um, but offensively, he's not – everybody's just kind of not finding their way in some way or another. Um, Kalel Ware stood out to me as like the main positive – Against Florida Gulf Coast in his opening game, 13 points, 12 rebounds, 4 assists, 3 blocks, 2 steals. He makes a 3, 8 of 12 from the line. Um, there was, like, there's not much more in that game that I think you want to see from him. Maybe a little, the thing with him is always going to be the engagements and what does that look like. But he comes back for uh, game 2 as well and adds 20, or, uh, 20 points, 6 boards, 1 block, 1 steal. He was a big reason that they ended up winning this game against Army is um, the second half especially. They just started feeding the ball to Renew and Ware and said, okay, we have the size advantage. We're just going to let you score. Um, again, but though even the Army game, uh, Ryan Curry goes four of eight from three. In general, Army goes 13 of 38. So that's you know, 13 threes um, in both games. Sorry, I'm looking up stats. 13 threes in both games against Indiana, and IU had four in both games. Um, so they're getting beat on the perimeter. They don't have like a consistent shooter. The one is Xavier Johnson. Xavier Johnson, like kind of probably scares some people and he gets some respect as a three point shooter. I don't know if Trey Galloway does, even though he shot really well last year, he just doesn't take high enough volume. Um, and then when you have the size of renew and wear down low, teams are just going to focus on that more. There's just nobody. McBacco hasn't fit yet. And he's the one that could potentially. Against Army, he plays 16 minutes. He has two shot attempts. One of them was very much scripted. It was to like a pin in to get him a little 16 footer. The other was like this 16 foot post fadeaway that just felt like he was putting it up because he hadn't shot the ball yet. Um, if he isn't going offensively, he hasn't been good defensively. And I think you get more from Gabe Cups, who's been really pretty good off the bench. He's against the Florida Gulf Coast. He comes in with eight or 12 minutes. One of the went for one of the media times out timeouts. Um, and then it's Johnson, Cubs, Scalloway, and that's when IU was at their best. Three guards, Cubs was making plays. Cubs is a, an aggressive defender, really quick hands. Um, you're hoping that the shot falls. He was one for four against Army from three, but a dude that can make good plays. I thought the passing wasn't great against Army, but it wasn't for anybody on the Indiana team. Um, but that might be who they have to go to. I was There's hope that CJ Gunn could be that guy, and then they have like more of a true score in theory with Gunn, who's also 6'6", and can defend, I think, pretty well. Um, the one thing that concerns me is just the talk is Mbako not fitting as like a three. My, I think my biggest concern with Indiana is that their two best players are Kalel Ware and Malik Renew, and that they don't fit together defensively. Um, it just seems like not the best fit, and there's still plenty of time. I still think that this defense should be pretty good or even really good, um, but... That was the one that worried me is like those two might be the best players on this team and they both just might be the five. Like I just don't know if Renew can fit well enough on the perimeter and where is such an elite shot blocker, you almost can't afford to have him go out. So um, 
I don't know. That's I don't want to go crazy. I mean, I'm trying going to go through all 14 teams. So we're not going to go crazy, crazy in depth. Try to keep it to probably a few minutes per team and then move on to the week ahead. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, probably talk about them more in depth, either done on an individual episode or just coming forward. Next up is Iowa. Um, and when I talk through these teams, I am going to try to be as transparent as possible. Iowa is one of the teams I've just watched the least. They had two bye games. They win both. They beat North Dakota 110 to 68. They beat Alabama State 98 to 67. Um, I was I'm pretty low on Iowa coming into the season. Payne Sanford looks good though um, in that kind of lead scoring role. He's shooting the ball well. Um, you know, three of seven in game one, four of ten in game two from three. 21.17 points. This is just a. This was my concern when I put them so low is that Iowa is just going to be who Iowa is. And Fran McCaffrey is just going to be like, all right, we're going to be a top 10 offense. Our defense is going to be whatever it is. And it's just going to win us games. Um, they play Creighton Tuesday. That's going to be one I'm absolutely tuned into because I think it'll actually give me a better sense. Um, I was, was when I was when I was watching the North Dakota game, I didn't catch any of the Alabama state. When I watched the North Dakota game, the defense just felt like, it's just a bunch of guys kind of trying. It's a t- it's a defense that doesn't seem to help a ton. It's very much um, kind of leaving guys on islands, and then if they get beat, there's it's, it is what it is. The offense is just so good. Like Cricky fits in perfectly. Payne Sanford's going to do his thing. Um, like they can just get the ball out so quick. This is this isn't new stuff for Iowa. I'm not you know coming up with some crazy new analysis. It's just that's who Iowa is. Uh, they're shooting. 39.6% from three so far through the two games. Cricky's knocked one down. Perkins is one for four. Patrick McCaffrey's three for eight. Um, they just they got they just got dudes that can can do it on offense. I am going to talk about Brock Harding because he had um, in game one in both games he had seven assists each. He has a 71% assist rate. Not enough minutes to like qualify for anything because he's only played 26 minutes. He has 14 assists in 26 minutes. Like. I still think Brock Harding is the eventual starting point guard. Bowen's been solid. I like Josh Dix, um, but I just think like Brock Harding is just different. He's just different. And honestly, this freshman class in general, Owen Freeman's had some spurts. Um, even Price Price Stanford off the bench, Lodgy Dembele. Like I think both of them have had spurts. Dembele shot a couple threes in rhythm, very confident. That's intriguing to me because I didn't think he was much of a shooter coming in. Um, yeah, like this just. This team might be go like if this freshman class ends up being really good, then maybe they could be a pretty solid, like a top five team in this Big Ten because of just how down this league seems like it could be. But they're a team, like I said, I haven't, they're the team I haven't watched a ton of. They just seem like they're going to be who Iowa is always, and that's going to be is what they are. Um, Next is Maryland, who's going to be, you know, they're probably the most disappointing team. Uh, They played the Asheville like tournament or whatever. They, Week, their first game, they beat Mount St. Mary 68-53. They lose both Asheville games. They lose to Davidson 64-61 and UAB 66-63. They need a shooter. That's it's it is that's what it is. They're 22.6% from three right now. Jameer Young's four for 13. Um, Noah Bachelor's two for eleven. He has to shoot the ball well. Dante Scott shot better against UAB. So that helps out. Um He's their leading shooter though right now, thirty three percent. Deshaun Harris Smith is one for nine. I think, I think Harris Smith's gonna be good. I think he's just taking a bit more time. Um, he has the physicality. I think I like the defense a lot. It's just whether he can actually adjust. Jamie Kaiser might end up being the most important player. Like, maybe not most important, but like, if they want to find a shooter, it might be in Jamie Kaiser. They tried Geronimo the first two games starting. It's just a clunky fit because I think he's more of a four. Um, and he doesn't provide much shooting. That's where Jamie Kaiser could come in as this three and D type player. And then as Harris Smith gets more comfortable getting downhill, Jameer Young's going to do his thing. Um, he's, I think he's still played pretty well. He's for, he's had to force a bit on offense that hasn't been the best. Um, and then the most efficient, he goes over three in game one from three, one for four in game three. Um, but they just, they need shooting. They need spacing desperately. Julian Reese against UAB only has four shot attempts. Um, again, transparency, UAB is a game I'm going to watch tomorrow. So, like, why did he only have four shot attempts? Did have five fouls, still played 28 minutes. Um, that can't happen. Julian, Julian Reese cannot get four shot attempts in a game just straight up. My guess is UAB just didn't care about any of the shooting. 
and we're just like we're just going to hone in on the post and, and at the rim um, and take all of that away. So that'll be what I'm going look forward to next. Next is a, probably the best looking team, at least relative to expectations in Michigan. Uh, they looked really, really good in pulling up their games. Beat UNC Asheville 99 to 74 in game one, Youngstown State 92 to 62 in game two. Two teams that aren't like in terms of mid majors aren't terrible. I don't know how good they are um, in terms of like the mid major level, especially, but. You play who's in front of you, and Michigan looked good. Uh, the offense was absolutely clicking. Doug McDaniels is just doing what he wants right now. He put up um, 22 points and eight assists in game one, 16 points, four assists in game two. Condors has the offense on a string. It seems like um, Terrence Williams is fitting well at the three, which is going to be needed because that was the talk is, hey, Michigan has seven players that play the four. What's going <clears> to <throat> excuse me? What's going to happen? He's five for nine from three. Small sample size. Things can change. But if they get that type of shooting, um, he seems confident. He seems comfortable way more than last year. And then that allows Olivier Nakama to play the four and just be who he is. Be a guy that can get to the high post. Be a guy that finishes at the rim. Um, he put up what he put up. 25 in game one on 10 of 12 shooting from two, one of four from three. Game two, 17 points, 10 rebounds, four assists, two blocks. He's probably the best player on the team, but Doug McDaniel, it might be Doug McDaniel. Like those, that's a really, really good one two punch. Um, they need to figure out exactly what they want to do defensively. I think Youngstown State, it was better, um, but there's so much length out there. Namari Burnett is, what is he, six, five, six, four at the two guard. Doug McDaniel's obviously small, but then you have Terrence Williams, who's six, seven, Olivier Nakama, six, nine, Terrace Reed, six, ten as your starter. Like that's a lot of length, and Namari Burnett's a really good perimeter defender. So if they can get some sort of consistent defensive identity, which I think could come, um, and they keep up this offense, like the way that this Big Ten is, they could be a top three team in this. Um, I don't, I'm not there yet on them. I want to see it against a couple good teams, and they they have a they have a schedule coming up. St. John's, Long Beach State isn't, you know, Long Beach State's a solid mid-major um, that just beat DePaul. Uh, and then they have Memphis, Oregon, then two Big Ten games. So We'll find it. That's another team. We'll find out more come early December. Like how legitimate is this? But the St. John's game is going to be big, um, and that'll be one that'll really tell me if the defense is there and the offense stays. I don't expect them to shoot forty percent from three, but if you know if they're a thirty-six percent shooting team from three, like that's big. Um, that still scares me. Will Shedders right now is do, looking really good off the bench as the backup five. He's six of six from three, which influences the shots a bit. Um, I think. When we look at the three-point shooting, that is something to consider. Of Terrence Williams is five of nine. Will Shedder is six of six. Like that is big. That is big for a small sample size. Um, does that continue? So, uh, but they they need they need another guard until Jalen Wellens back. George Washington has looked like a freshman, which is fair. Um, I think he, he's going to take some time to adjust. Obviously, they have a backup big in Trey Jackson, who has kind of fit in as this three. They've had some – they put out some weird lineups where it's like Terrence Williams at the two or Trey Jackson at the two and the other at the three, however you want to look. Um, basically just six, nine dudes everywhere and then Doug McDaniel. Um, that is interesting to me. That could be a fun defensive lineup if everybody buys in. Now their in-state counterpart, MSU, um, they go – you go from Michigan, one of the most you know uh, positive-looking teams, to one of the most negative-looking teams in Michigan State's comparative to – what their preseason expectations were. Michigan State loses game one to James Madison, 79 to 76 in overtime. They beat Southern Indiana, um, one of the bottom you know, 20 D1 teams in the country, 74 to 51. And in that game, you probably came away with more uh, questions than answers. The big thing is, and I'll, I'll hit on it first, they're two for 31 from three right now. When I think of this team, and the reason I'm still going to have them fairly high on my like big 10 rankings is it'll be on my Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB, which you can go check out. I have a lot of threads uh, film there as well, but I still, I'm still a believer that they're going to be an okay shooting team. When we talk about the big 10 being bad, Michigan state is going to be the first team that comes up. Joey Hauser is, is show, it has been pretty clear. Like, Oh yeah. Joey Hauser was this insanely important person 
um, shooting like 45% from three on high volume, just stretch the defense. They have no threat from three right now uh, or no, no player that teams respect from three Malik Hall could be that he's had spurts of it, um, but that's what he's, it's just been spurts and he hasn't looked confident shooting the ball. Michigan state needs to figure out whatever they want to do at center, whether it be, you know, Cooper or Xavier Booker comes in because they have, um, Izzo's mentioned like he's not afraid to play the freshman. I assume a change has to come soon. Um, Tyson Walker is only one for seven from three. Jane Aikens is over six. Those aren't going to stay. Like they are pretty proven as 40% three point shooters. I fully expect that to come back, but they're getting tougher looks. Teams can sell out specifically on them too. Um, and when you get to some of these pin downs for walkers, you're just teams are top locking him a little bit more, really forcing him into mid range, which he's fine taking. And he had 35 points against James Madison and almost single handedly carried them to a win. But what does it look like now when it's only when this shot diet's like only mid range jumpers and the threes are like step backs and off the dribbles? Um, Jaden Akins has had a few good looks, just hasn't fallen. He has to be able to develop something off the bounce. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the it's going to be – these freshmen are going to have to contribute. A.J. Hogard hasn't looked great this year. There's, he's just kind of looked off. And when he's off, then somebody has to be able to facilitate because now it, when he's off – when he's on, he can just make open looks for Aikens and Walker. But when he's off, now they have to create themselves, and it's just not as efficient. Jeremy Fears has upside, and I think he's one trillion percent the point guard of the future. How quickly does he get it? I think there was good spurts, and he could bring really good defensive intensity. Um, there was a period in the Southern Indiana game he kind of was picking them apart, uh, but he's also had moments where he seemed like he was really forcing. Uh, Cohen Carr is probably the biggest bright spot for this team. Like I think he just brings absolutely everything that Michigan State needs. Um, somebody that can get to the rim, attack, like just super athletic, defense assistant. He has to figure out specifically off-ball defense. He's got lost quite a few times on back cuts and things like that. He has to figure out what exactly do I look like on defense. I think I wouldn't be shocked if he's the four at some point, like a starting four, um, and just bring this true rim presence to that starting lineup. Bring Malik Hall off the bench where he may be more comfortable in general. Um, and then the other one, Xavier Booker. He hasn't gotten a ton of minutes. He played Five in game one, he played 17 in game two. I think you saw some of the intensity come out and aggression in game two. Um, he, in the exhibition games, he showed that he could shoot a three. He was only like a 26% three-point shooter in high school, I think. Uh, something like 24 of 82, something like that. He's willing to shoot. If he can knock him down, then that would be interesting for him to be in the line, starting lineup because now it is sort of a third shooter. Um, and if he's, if, if he's with Hall, now you have two sh sort of shooters to go with Walker and Aikens and now Hogard hopefully can facilitate more. Um, but something's going to change. I also, like I said, I fully expect some of the shooting to increase. Like I just think that they're, they're going to knock down good looks. I trust their defense still. I'm, I'm sticking with that. They have the best, like they have the best perimeter defense in the conference, probably one of the best in the country. The only concern is size and what happens when there's, they go up against bigger guards, but we'll find out more about that. Maybe in games like Duke or things like that, they have a couple tough ones coming up. Um, we'll go to Minnesota who's been, if Michigan has been like the most overachieving or quote unquote relative to their preseason projection, Minnesota's just been straight up the most surprising. Um, this Minnesota team would beat last year's Minnesota team by 15 or 20. I'm pretty confident in that their defense is not good. They seem to be lost a lot on the defense, but their offenses look good. They're shooting 41% from three. Uh, they're shooting 80% from the free throw line. Elijah Hawkins and um, Mike Mitchell both, especially Elijah Hawkins at the starting, like he's brought up, they both bring ability to push the ball right now. Like I said, two games, but they're 88th in offensive adjusted uh, tempo per Kempom. Last year, they were 320th. The year before, they were 293rd. Um, than the two years under Ben Johnson. It's just when the offense is bad like that, I really think teams should push. And now Ben Johnson went out and got two guys in Elijah Hawkins and Mike Mitchell who can run point and push the ball. Isaiah Innan, um, great story. Obviously, he's been hurt for a couple years. He's looked phenomenal. He, like, I don't know if he's going to play more of the three or the four, if um, what happens with Pharrell Payne, if he gets keeps his starting spot or not. But he's looked good. He's an athletic big or like wing-ish type forward. 
He's shooting six or seven from three. I don't expect that to sustain, but still, if he shoots the ball well, super long, like can be, I think, a positive defender on a team that doesn't have many. Um, just excited to see him. Dawson Garcia is doing what he does and showing that, hey, he's a top 10 player in the conference. Um, first game, 23 points, 14 rebounds, six assists, one block. Second game, 22 points, six rebounds, three assists, two blocks, one steals. Getting to the line a ton, just being the guy that Minnesota can go to when they need something on offense because there is still in the half court on my concerns that they are getting very stagnant on offense. Um, Cam Christie, in his he debuted in this game too. He looked really good. I think he could eventually be starting this year. Um, yeah, I think the depth is still a little bit of concern just because you have a lot of unproven. Parker Fox is another guy who hasn't played for a while. I think he's looked fine. Um, but yeah, this team is rolling on offense, and that is not something you could say last year. They beat two very bad teams by a lot at home. Kind of the theme, obviously, for the first week in college basketball for, for most teams in general is like you beat up on bad teams. What happens when you play a good team? Um, they do not have a hard non-conference. They have two non-conference games that are uh, relatively difficult. Then one of those will be this week with Missouri. They play them at home. That one I'll be tuned into because that's another one. It's just like, okay, you can do it against these buy games. What does it look like against a better, like a solid D1 team? Um, but I'm, I'm excited. Right now they are enjoyable to watch, and that was not the case last year. So um, happy for them. Excited to see where they go. Head over to Nebraska, who's also another team that's just dominated. Uh, two really bad teams. They beat Lindenwood 84-52, to 52, Florida A&M 81-54. to 54. Um, And, yeah, just two teams that – they needed to beat by no Kese Tominaga, uh, no Jawan Gary, no, there's, I think, oh, I know it should be better than this. There's somebody else that was out with injury. Um, Blaze Keita, that was who it was. So they they got injuries, but it looks solid together. Like they're, the offense seems to be playing with a lot of tempo. The defense is pretty similar to last year in the terms of really helping at the rim. Um, and just doing that. One thing that's interesting is like they forced, I think, a lot of more mid ranges. Um, like last year, last year they had forced teams to shoot a ton of threes through two games. It's actually quite the opposite of that. Uh, teams are not too shooting a bunch of threes against them. I'm actually, I'm looking, I'm going to pull up their uh, defensive shot chart really quick, which is why I am kind of stalling right here. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's tough to say exactly who they are without Kese as well. Uh, yeah, tons of mid ranges is, is what it is. Minimal threes, minimal rim, ton of mid ranges. That's a recipe for success in general, um, especially against two bad teams like that. They are they are a team that like their first like real test you could say is Duquesne in uh, middle November. Um, after that, it's Creighton, and that's December. Although they probably the Duquesne games might be in a Thanksgiving tourney, so they might play somebody else in there. It's a team that I'm going to keep tabs on, but um, they're taking care of bad teams right now. And that's, again, you just need to do that. Their defenses look solid. I've liked the fit of like Bryce Williams into what they want to do. Jamarcus Lawrence seems comfortable running the points, which means John Coleman's off the bench. Now you you got, you know, point guards, like quality point guard play for pretty much all the minutes. They're shooting pretty well from three. Um, and it's pretty spread out. Rank Moss fits in perfectly. Josiah Alec is also another guy that I think once they get some of these injuries back, some of these guys back, it'll be better because then Alec can truly be the backup five, and I don't know if he keeps the starting spot or not. I think the mass um, Alec fit is a little clunky, but overall, I don't have too much on this team. They've looked good beating bad teams. Let's see them keep doing it. Um, on to Northwestern, who went 2-0. They beat Binghamton 72-61 and then Dayton 71-66, both games at home. Um, it's going to be a lot of boo-booey on offense. Uh, I think Ryan Langbord stepped up more in the second game, which is good to see. And then Brooks Barnheiser is the story. He's been going nuts in the two games. First game, 18 points, 13 rebounds. Second game, 13 points, 10 rebounds, 3 assists. Um, getting to the line a ton. They're going to need him as a small ball four to do basically everything that Boo Booey doesn't. Um, on offense, it isn't going to be crazy efficient again. They just have to hope that their defense holds up. I have concerns. I just, it was a good win against Dayton, um, one that they desperately needed because Dayton is probably the best team they play in all of the non conference schedule. 
they they desperately needed that. Um, the only other right now, the only other top 100 Ken Palm team that they'd play in non-conference, it's Arizona State. They don't, the only other top 100 team they play before January 2nd is Purdue, uh, number one in Ken Palm. Um, the defense just scares me a bit because Nicholson is good. Preston is fine off the bench at rim protection. It just seemed like nothing. It seemed like Northwestern has a very they are built upon their system. They aren't built on individual defenders, especially this year, like with Adige leaving. Um, I don't think they have a ton of individually good defenders, but they have a good scheme of doubling the post. Their switch, their off ball switching is just an amazing. It just absolutely shuts um, some sets down for opposing team. So much fun to watch, but that requires a lot of communication. That requires a lot of point switching. That requires a lot of contact to contact switching. And there was times that it just didn't happen and it breaks down. Um, and that's a big concern for me is then what happens. And now I, I like when you get one-on-one -on -one against some of these guys, like, I don't think Bowie's a great one-on-one -on -one defender. Um, you can provide a bunch of help, but if they are getting, if teams are getting into the paint and then kicking out, what exactly does that look like? Um, but with that being said, you know, they were able to hold off the three point shooting. I think the Dayton specifically that matchup with, um, uh, with Duran Holmes kind of as, as their stretch five big that took Nicholson out of the paint a lot. He kind of um, Holmes had a big stretch in there. And the the thing with this team is Northwestern is going to sh make teams shoot a lot of three, like a lot of three pointers. If you hit them, you're going to be in a good spot to win. They've overcome that in two games though. Um, you look at both games, uh, the first game against, or the first game against Binghamton, they go seven to twenty-three, which is whatever. And then game, Dayton goes twelve to twenty-three, and from three, and they still beat them. That's big. Um, Boo Boo is doing what he does on offense, and it's just going to be a lot of him, like a lot of shots from him. The thing that made me feel better is that Ryan Langboard looked good in really in both games, but especially the second game. I think he's going to get integrated more and more into the offense, and he has to be the number two option. Uh, moving on, we have Ohio State now who, um, again, transparency, I have not watched the Texas A&M game that is on the docket for tomorrow, and I will 100% do it, but I wanted to get this out. You know, I want this. The goal with this podcast is every Monday morning, there will be a podcast in your audio feed, which are on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or if you're watching on YouTube, um, Monday morning, it'll be there for your drive to work, whatever. Just an hour, hour and a half of recapping the Big Ten week and previewing the next. Um, but yeah, so Ohio State, have not watched the Texas A and M game, so there isn't for me personally. There isn't as much to talk about, but the Oakland game they won seventy nine to seventy three and was a game that shouldn't have been close, but it was. They lose to Texas A and M at home seventy three to sixty six. Um, the first game is what I'm going to talk about because that's what I watched. Um, they didn't shoot well from three. Um, battle started well and then kind of fell off. Thorn shot the ball pretty well. They just could not attack at all. Um, it was Gale was the only one that was getting into the Oakland zone. They tried setting a bunch of ball screens. It didn't really work. Gale was the only one that was actually attacking into the lane and then facilitating. And he's probably like, I don't know if it's a hot take or not. He's the best facilitator on the team right now. I think I trust him more than Thorne in terms of pure facilitating. Um, five assists in game one, six assists in game two. He needs to knock down a three. He shot really well last year. I think the threes will come. He's going to be a super, super important piece for this team. Scotty Middleton off the bench is, you know, I think he's going to also be a big piece. I don't, I would expect him to start at some point. Game one, he plays well. They win. Game two, he is not good. Um, just two points, no rebounds, one turnover, one block. He's going to need to be a three and D guy. Um, Jamison Battle, they were kind of, he, he got lost on defense a good bit. Um, I think there was a lot of defensive lapses for a team that is not expected to be great defensively. Um, it's big that they have Akpara and Key both working now. Like separately, they're going to have 40 minutes of good Big Ten or good center play in the Big Ten. That's going to be key. Key looked key looked good in Game One, um, and it was a big reason in that second half why they ended up winning because they just kind of fed him the ball and he was able to work and do his thing down low. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of scrolling through some notes. Like, I don't have a ton. They need to knock down shots. Um, they need to be able to attack. Like, whether that is Thornton or Gail Thornton, you know, I think put up good numbers in game two, especially. So something to keep an eye on. I don't, Battle needs to also be a guy that can actually get downhill. Um, 
last year in Minnesota, he took 193s. He took 152s, but out of those 150, I believe like 34 were at the rim. It was a ton of mid-range. He only has taken four twos now compared to 12 threes. He's got to get downhill at some point. It just, it just has to happen. Uh, moving on to Penn State, who looks really good in game one and then did not look as good in game two. Uh, they win both though. They beat Delaware State in 79 to 45. They beat Lehigh 74 to 65. This is a team that I'm going to I'll, I'll talk about for only a second because I I truly do want to see another week. Um, they only play by games these next two weeks as well. Some bad teams, but still, just how does all these pieces fit together? Kanye Clary is looks really really good and like. He just might be the leader or the offensive leader for this team. Ace Baldwin looked much better in game two, but game one, he struggled. I think he's trying to find his fit exactly, just with as long with everybody else. Um, you know, Puff Johnson has been hurt, so what does it look like when he's back? Judas Wahab, I think that was a sneaky good pickup because it gives them a quality center for 20, 25 minutes a game. Um, the defense is going to be fun. I'm I'm excited. The defense is going to be fun. Nick Kern is a dude that can just hound people. I like Zach Hicks on the perimeter. DeMarco Dunn, I think, is a good defender. Baldwin is Clary's super quick. Like I think up and down, they just have good guys um, that can defend you. And then on offense, they're going to have to figure out their identity. They're I assume they're going to keep pushing the ball like they have been and try to convert turnovers into points. That's just been what Mike Rhodes has done at VCU and had success with. I expect that to carry over here. Um, and that's why I think that they win five or six games in the Big Ten is they just muck up enough that they just have a game with 30 transition points and win. Um, only a few teams less I'm hope left. I'm hoping I haven't skipped anybody. If I have, it is what it is. Uh, next is Purdue. Anybody that is watching on YouTube, you can obviously see behind me. I, you know, um, I cover Purdue for Boilers in the Stands, which you should definitely go check out. If you are a Purdue fan and do not already go watch. Um, but yeah, Purdue, two bye games. Um, Sanford, they beat 98 to 45. They were up 21 to 1. Moorhead State, they beat 87 to 57. A little closer in the first half. In the second half, they blew it open. There's, with all the offseason stuff, um, nothing's going to be answered really until they play some good teams. And hey, guess what? That's going to happen. Play Xavier next week. Then the week after that, they're in Maui. Uh, they only have three games left against teams that are below 100 in Kempom ratings right now. Obviously, that can change, and a couple teams may slip to 100 in the Big Ten, but the non-conference is going to be nuts, and we're going to find out a lot about this team. Some things that stood out, um, Braden Smith is being crazy aggressive. Like He is hunting his shot out of pick and roll. He is getting up threes. He is getting up pull, you know, getting to his pull ups. And then that's opening up stuff for being able to facilitate for others later and create these different passing windows that just wasn't weren't there um, when in games last year when he wasn't looking for a shot. He is so aggressive and it is absolutely needed. He's also pushing the ball, him and Lance Jones. And that's kind of the big things I think with this team is um, their offensive pace right now is 70th. The last year, 335th the year before that 206th the year before that 295th the year before that 314th um this is a team in general that's pay painter has been a very slow offense let your big man set up he's like hey run push you see smith demanding the ball immediately after a rebound you see lance jones demanding the ball immediately after a rebound or smith grabs the ball and now he throws it up to lance jones and now lance jones is attacking and getting to the rim um this is yeah this team is way more versatile than last year. The, this is a team that right now, and just like the rest of them, they need to do it against good teams. This is a team that looks like they can beat you in multiple ways this year. They could not beat you in multiple ways last year. Defenses looked really, really good. Um, ED is elite down low. Lance Jones gives them a, a really good point of attack perimeter defender that's athletic. We need to see it against bigger wings, and that's going to be the concern, but... Um, he's looked really good. He's going to have some shots that just make Purdue fans shake their head. And like, I don't think his shooting is going to be the most important thing that he brings. He's going to have games that he shoots 0 for 5 from 3. He's going to have games that he shoots 4 for 6 from 3. He hit a 35-foot transition pull-up in the last game against Morehead State. That's just who he is. Um, but what he does bring that's going to be absolutely needed is defense and being able to push the ball and get to the rim. He's shown that. He seems like he fits really well. Um Heidi Camden and Heidi's looked really good off the bench is like this, you know, he's the freshman that's going to seems like he's popped another super athletic guy can 
get to the rim pretty easily. He loves attacking baseline. Miles Colvin is going to take, I think, a little bit more time to really work in. Another super athletic guy off the bench that can score. He's not afraid to shoot the ball. Um, and Purdue shooting well, 46% through two games, small sample size, see it against good teams, all of that. But there are a lot of promising things uh, with this team. And, and, you know, I haven't even talked about Zach Eady. Zach Eady's just done what he does. He's only played 20 minutes game one, 24 in game two, um, you know, 16 and 11, 18 and eight, th- four blocks game one, three blocks game two. Like, uh, he's the, the team is just so much worse defensively when he's off the floor. Like I, I don't want to go too in depth on Purdue right now because I want to. I think we'll talk plenty this year as they play good teams and as we get close to the March and all that stuff's going to come back. But um, good to see them. Good to see them do what they do and just be bad teams. Like that's along with the rest of them. Like you got to do it against good teams, but also you play who you play. Um, it is a good that they beat them. And then we go to Rutgers, who did not beat everybody. They lost to Princeton, who's I was you know Princeton is a good team don't get me wrong this isn't like a end of the world loss but also they lose to princeton game 168 to 61 on a neutral court they beat boston university 69 to 45 they beat bryant 66 to 57 boston and bryant games they looked really just sluggish in the first half um this is a team that just needs to figure out their, what they want to do on offense they're seeming to want to push more and get up threes they're not shooting the ball well at all, which hurts. Um, their best shooter right now, percentage-wise, is 33% from Oscar Palmless, who is two for six. Gavin Griffiths is struggling from three. This is a team that's just the, – the offense doesn't create any pressure points. Um, Amori can be a post-up guy, but I don't know if that's what their best offense is, is feeding him post-touches. And then the defense is taking – it's just – it's going to take a step back. It's still going to be good but it's not going to be last year. They they lost a lot of size on the wing and at guard, and I think that really made up what they want. Fernandes is a good on-ball defender, but he's 5'11", and it's just a different – it's going to be a different system. They need Mwap back, back, obviously. Um, Antoine Wolfpolk has looked good. He's you know looking like he could take that sophomore year jump. Jermichael Davis is a freshman. He's actually looked good, and it seems like um, Tycho trusts him right away on defense and just, just in general. He's a pretty athletic small guard. Um, Derek Simpson hasn't gotten going yet, and he absolutely needs to. I think he's done a pretty good job facilitating the ball, um, which is one of the things I wanted to see him take a jump in. But he needs to. He just simple analysis: make your shots. But like, it is just what it is. Like, he's got to be a guy that goes out and scores for them, and, and they desperately need it um, defensively. Like, they're they've looked good, but. It's just it's just not quite where it is last year, um, and that's going to be the big concern for me going forward with them. I, I don't, yeah, I just don't, I don't see right now. Maybe once they get Mag back, it'll be better, but right now I just don't see a scenario how they become even like a top ten team in the Big Ten, except for hey, the Big Ten might just be bad, and it doesn't matter. Uh, last team that we'll talk about before previewing next week is the Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin, uh, they beat Arkansas State 105 to 76 in game one, and they beat Tennessee 80 to seven or lose to Tennessee, sorry, lose to Tennessee 80 to 70 in game two. Wisconsin's good. Um, they're gonna be Big Ten good this year as well, because Big Ten might not just might not have the firepower that it does in the regular season. They're just not, I don't know if they're elite. They're I'm still really, really concerned about what their interior defense looks like. Uh, t- Tennessee pretty much got what they wanted inside. Tennessee shot uh, 23 for 39 in the interior. Dalton Connect went seven for 11. Like, pretty much just got what they wanted. AJ Store needs to be a better defender. Like, he's their athletic guy. Klesmit, uh, we're going to talk specifically with Tennessee here. Like, Store got the primary matchup on Net Connect. He kind of got worked they tried klezman but klezman is just a little too undersized not quite athletic enough um they need store to be a better defender i have liked that the offense has been a little bit more pushing the ball kind of getting out there it also hasn't primarily featured wall and crawl which i think just is going to be when wisconsin's at their best is when those two are not the primary you had a stretch in the second half against tennessee that wall was and it just didn't go the best Depth is, con- is a major concern. My, my guy, John Blackwell, has looked solid. Um, Connor Seijin, Nolan Winter, that's kind of the three that they trust off the bench, like one guard, one wingish, and one big. Um, it's going to be a lot of minutes for the, for the starters, and hopefully it doesn't wear them down by the end. Um, 
offensively, like, you know, they put up 105 against Arkansas States, who's, you know, whatever is a mid-major. Um, you know, it, I don't know. I, it, Wisconsin's one of the more confusing teams to me, and I have watched both of their games. Like, I think they're going to be good because it's just, they're Wisconsin, they're just solid. I just don't think that there's really a big ceiling, if that makes sense. Um, I have like what AJ Store brings offensively is this dude that can just actually get his own shot and get to the rim. He's not afraid to chuck him up. A little concerned that they were like forcing him post ups. Um, I didn't love those because those just turned into post fades at a lot of times. Chucky's been pretty good, I think, about selecting his shots. That's been a big thing. I think he knows now like there's other guys that can shoot and create their shots, so he doesn't have to be tasked with all of that. Um, but one thing I'll look at is facilitating the assist. They're 254th in assist rate right now. It's been it's been almost weirdly too much kind of this isolation like not one on one but like pick and roll type um not pick and roll even just post ups it's weird um but that's that's my stance on Wisconsin it's weird i'll find out more in the in the coming weeks um but they're i think they're going to be better than last year they, i there should be a tourney team would be my guess um so that is all 14 teams i think talked about them oh yeah yeah yes we talked about all 14 teams, and if we did not, my bad. I'll get you next week. Um, but yeah, we can just. I'm going to quickly hit on is the Big Ten good or not? And I, I put up a poll on like how much do you, it, it just on how much do you value your preseason priors for like what you thought of teams compared to week one? Like how much do you actually take away for week one? And it varies. And I don't think there's a right answer from person to person or even team to team. Maybe one team like um, what's a good example? I, I'm pretty. I was pretty high and pretty strong on Maryland being good this year, and so because of that, I'm gonna give it a couple more games. Like, but a team like Indiana, I was like, I think that their defense should be good, so they'll be okay. But I wasn't sold. They haven't looked good, so now I'm like, I'm gonna be quicker to worry about that. Um, whether that's fair or not, or right or wrong, that's just how I'm going about it. Um, but it just it seems like it's Purdue. Like, it seems like Purdue is tier one. There's no tier two teams. And then it's like Illinois, Maryland, or I don't even know if you want Maryland's probably not even in it. Illinois, Michigan State, maybe Michigan, maybe. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting somebody that should be in that. Wisconsin. Like those four are kind of the next tier, and like they all have their issues. Um, Illinois' issue may just be Illinois might be the best, the second best team in the Big Ten. Their thing might just be that they play down a competition. If that's the case, then they'll be fine. I think, like, I still think Michigan State will be fine. Um, it just seems it. I it just seems like there's a big gap between Purdue and the rest. Uh, I will say that the bottom may not like. Last year it was Purdue a couple game gap, and then it was like two through eleven, or two through twelve, and then it was like a couple game gap. Ohio State gigantic gap. Minnesota, the way Minnesota's looked, Penn State looks like I could see it being more of like a Purdue, and then like. Two through 14, there's no like gaps in between. There's there's clear rankings. I'm not saying like Minnesota is number th the third best team. You could I'm not saying you should argue that, but more of like it's like, okay, you have this tier, and then immediately behind you have this tier, and then this tier. Like, whereas the bottom teams might still be decent, and there really is no nights off. Um, that you you kind of haven't had that in the Big Ten, I think, for the past even couple of years. Let me look through real quick. Um, you know, obviously last year Minnesota Ohio State were bad, the year before Minnesota and Nebraska were very bad. Um, yeah, year before that, Nebraska again, like the year before that, Nebraska, Northwest. Yeah, you usually have a couple teams that are bad, and the, the bottom of the Big Ten might be better than usual. However, that's only going to be because the top is not as good as it's going to be. Uh, there's lots of holes for pre literally every team, even Purdue, who's looked good, like, and is clearly the best. There's, we need to see, like, what is a, you know, there's the Arkansas game, super athletic, super long team. Can they handle that in, in going forward? So that's just kind of my quick take. I'm somebody that I'm going to believe my priors in general, though, more than one week. I want to see at least one more week. I, I would say after after the Thanksgiving week, when everybody's kind of gone through their feast week tournaments, that's when I'll probably more or less have no value in what my offseason priors were and just be being like, okay, this is what the teams were. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to watch every team as much as possible, I believe. I have watched, I have, a, I have a track, so I'll put it up on Twitter. Right now, I have 28 games watched. I'm also going to watch Monday morning. 
Um, I'll watch. I have four. I have five on deck. Uh, one, two, three, four, five on deck. So that'll get up to 33. Um, so that's, you know, doesn't mean I know everything by any means because I don't. I'm still just just trying to figure out what these teams are. That's why I'm trying to watch so much. Um, I will say going for like I am doing women's coverage. Just again, I, I want to be transparent as possible. I I was very comfortable with what my knowledge was on the men's side coming in. Like I, I could go up and down pretty much literally every roster and be like, this guy does this, this guy does this. In general, I think they do this. Um, I don't. I didn't have that for women's, and so right now for me, it's just a lot of watching games, a lot of learning. Like, what exactly are these rosters? How do they fit? What are they trying to do? Um, without having the priors. So, the women's coverage is going to be, and I'm going to talk about the women's side more and more. Like, there were some good games. Iowa, the Iowa Virginia Tech game was really good. I think you know Iowa. The Kaitlyn Clark it can carry, obviously, because duh, she's Kaitlyn Clark. But like the others are going to get such good looks. They have to be able to create, especially like when teams put two on the ball, like Virginia Tech was for a bit. Um, they're gonna have to figure out some size stuff as well. They they don't have a like it's true big stealth um, looks solid, but like they're just not a huge team. So what happens then? But all that to say, women's coverage is one trillion percent coming. Just give me a couple weeks. As I am a guy who wants to be as knowledgeable as possible, whether that's good or bad. Um, it's just it's just what I am, who I am. So I'm going to keep keep chugging along on the women's side, keep watching because it's fun. It's good basketball. If you don't and you if you don't watch women's Big Ten right now and you um, enjoy college basketball, give it a shot. There's a lot of good teams, Iowa, Ohio State, Indiana, uh, Maryland. Like you can kind of go up even the middling teams like they're they're good. It's good basketball. So please go watch. Um, I, I recommend it. I think it's good basketball. I'm excited to talk about it more. I'm just not talking about it a ton right now because I want to get more info. So last thing we'll talk about is um, just the week ahead. I have, as I pull up the schedule here. So yeah, um, the week ahead is is looking good. It is getting some more games. We have the Gavit games, obviously. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll just kind of go day by day like we did last week, if you watched last week's podcast. Um, Monday, November 13th, four games on the men's side. Michigan at St. John's, Purdue versus Xavier. Versus Xavier, sorry, not Xavier, Xavier. Um, those two are going to be part of the Gavit games. Those are going to be really good games. Produce both of their teams' first real test. Um, Xavier's obviously down because of injuries and stuff, but still a solid team. Nebraska also takes on Ryder on the men's side, another bye game. They just, you know, they should win. On the women's side, Penn State takes on Kansas at 6 o'clock. Should be a solid game as well. Um, but, yeah, Monday will be for sure tuned in to Michigan and the – Purdue games. Those will probably be the two I'm keyed in on. On Tuesday, we're getting some some good games. Illinois takes on Marquette at home, got part of the Gavit games. Iowa takes on Creighton at Creighton. Um, those are going to be good games. Like I said, first real test for first real test for most of these teams. I would say the only one maybe that isn't is like Maryland this week. Um, they've had a couple um, Rutgers sort of with Princeton. Uh, obviously, Michigan State lost to James Madison. I'm just trying to think if there's others that I'm. Oh, Wisconsin, Tennessee. There it is. Um, Ohio State, Texas. United. Okay, there was a few. There was a few. Um, but yeah, Illinois versus Marquette, Iowa at Creighton on Tuesday. Michigan State takes on Duke. Um, Wisconsin takes on Providence. Those are probably the four best games of the day. The games I'll for sure watch. Northwestern also takes on Western Michigan. Penn State takes on St. Francis, uh, Pennsylvania. On the women's side, Michigan takes on Oakland. Nebraska takes on Elkhorn State. And Wisconsin takes on South Dakota State. I'm um, going to be focused more on the Gavit games definitely on that day. Wednesday on the men's side, Ohio State takes on Merrimack. Nebraska takes on Stony Brook. Rutgers takes on Georgetown. Gavit game um, should be interesting. Rutgers, like If Rutgers wants to be a solid team, that's a game they – Probably want to win and should win. On the women's side, I'm intrigued by the Northwestern at Notre Dame. Uh, Notre Dame's good. That's going to be a very tough test for a Northwestern team that's trying to get back on their feet. Illinois also takes on St. Peter's. Minnesota's women takes on North Dakota State. And Rutgers plays at Seton Hall. Thursday, we have IU Met. This for the men's side. We have two games. Uh, Indiana takes on Wright State. And then the game that I've kind of mentioned is Minnesota takes on Missouri. We'll be tuned into that for sure because I want to see what Minnesota actually does. Um, on the women's side, a couple of good games. You have Maryland at UConn. That is that is the game of the day, one of the best games of the week. Purdue takes on Texas A&M, uh, also a game I'll for sure be tuned into. 
Michigan State takes on Detroit Mercy. Ohio State takes on Boston College. Penn State takes on St. John's. Could be solid there. Friday, we get Illinois versus Valpo, Iowa versus Arkansas State. The game, then this game that I'm, I'll probably be tuned into the most for sure. Um, Maryland takes on Villanova at Villanova, part of the, the Gavit games. Hakeem Hart uh, takes on his former squad. He's now Villanova. Michigan State takes on Butler, which could be a sneaky good game. Michigan takes on Long Beach State. Penn State takes on Moorhead State. Wisconsin takes on Robert Morris. The lone women's game is Indiana plays Murray State. Um, Saturday, November 18th. On the men's side, you have Minnesota take on South Carolina Upstate, Nebraska versus Oregon State, first kind of ish test for Nebraska. Northwestern takes on Rhode Island, a bed one of the better teams that Northwestern will play in their non conference, and Rutgers takes on Howard. The game I'm pro- I'm most excited for on this day though is Illinois women's takes on Notre Dame. Um, very very excited for that. Michigan takes on Middle Tennessee, and Rutgers takes on with St. Francis on the women's side, and then Sunday. A um, couple of really good games. We have Illinois take on Southern. And then probably the game of the day is IU takes on UConn, uh, I believe, in Madison Square Garden. Michigan State plays Alcorn State. Ohio State plays Western Michigan. Uh, Northwestern was in the Hall of Fame tip, and I should have had this pulled up, but I don't actually know what the bracket looks like. I am doing that right now. Um, like I said, they played – Rhode Island the day before, or they'll play Rhode Island the day before, and they'll play either Mississippi State or Washington State. Again, big game for them as they don't have a ton of tough games. That's it for the men's side. Women's side, a lot of games. Um, IU takes on um, Lipscomb. Iowa takes on Drake. Maryland takes on Syracuse. Michigan women is in the battle for Atlantis. Um, Again, bad podcasting. I should have this pulled up. But I don't, so it is what it is. We're going to get some some typing right here. And they will play. It is just blurring. It is not, for whatever reason. Oh, there it is. Okay. They'll play either DePaul or South Dakota in that. Um, you know, games that could be decent. Um, that's So that's Michigan women's in the battle for Atlantis. Michigan State takes on Evansville. Minnesota plays UConn. Paige Becker's kind of heading home to uh, take on Minnesota in Minnesota. Nebraska takes on Creighton, which should be a good one, I think. Wisconsin plays at Kansas State. And Northwestern plays Southeast Missouri State. So a lot of good games. There's 57 total. We have two more weeks of a ton of games. And then from there, it's kind of drops down to 40 and then in the 30s um, going forward. But yeah. Big Ten is going to be interesting on the women's side. Even IU got smoked by Stanford. Uh, Maryland got smoked by South Carolina State. True road games, though, early in the season. I'm excited. I'm so happy basketball is back. Like I said, I've watched a ton of Big Ten basketball. I'm going to keep doing that. Um, plan is to do this podcast once a week. I have tons of, I've, you know, 12, 11 threads or whatever on my Twitter of breaking down film of Big Ten games. Want to plan? I think I'm going to have a video out this week on YouTube. If you are not subscribed, to definitely go check that out at Feed the Post. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. I appreciate that. If you're listening on audio, we are on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcast. Um, definitely, you know, please like, give a five star review, and just on the comments of wherever YouTube, audio, Twitter, uh, just tell me some things you want to see in these podcasts. I'm going to bring guests on for sure at some points. I'm going to do more team specific stuff at some point. Um, but I'm also going to have this overview. I want to kind of just have this hour. I mean, it's about an hour of me just ranting about uh, Big Ten basketball rambling. I hope it's coherent. Uh, we won't hit on every team every week. I just don't think that's feasible. I think a much better format will be hitting on a few teams in depth and kind of rotating through. Uh, but just this week, everybody played. I watched everybody at least once, if not twice, on the men's side and, and most team, most women's team at least once. Um yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to see where this season goes for a lot of teams. And, and I think it should be, even if the Big Ten's bad, it should be a fun year because then if there's a lot of teams that aren't great, it's going to be a lot of competitive games. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you can follow me on Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB or at Feed the Post on audio, YouTube. Um, and yeah, appreciate everybody tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next one.